Okay, here we're looking at answering the question, is it easier to, to hold your breath after inhalation or after exhalation and then hold your breath? So which one of those is it easier to hold your breath for a longer period of time? Well, actually it's easier to hold your breath after inhalation than after exhalation. So why is that? If you've ever tried this, you can try it for yourself. Try inhaling and holding your breath and exhaling and holding your breath. What's important there, the science behind this is that your bodies cannot detect low oxygen, but are sensitive actually to high carbon dioxide. Your brain actually uses blood carbon dioxide as an indicator for blood oxygen, so that when your CO2 levels are too high, you're signaled to take a breath. So your body is only looking at the carbon dioxide levels. It's making the, an assumption if carbon dioxide is high, then oxygen must be low. Now, if you find this hard to believe that low oxygen is not what makes you breathe, this is clearly a proof of concept, and that's carbon monoxide poisoning. What's happening during carbon monoxide poisoning is all these negative factors can also be death, sadly, or coma. The reason why this happens is because you're breathing air with low oxygen. The CO2 levels are actually the same in your body, and that's what's re regulating your breathing. So your breathing is actually as normal, even though, because your CO2 levels are normal, even though your oxygen levels are becoming dangerously low. You basically die without ever realizing it because you're oxygen deprived. So it's not because of low oxygen you start breathing more or start feeling shortness of breath. No, your oxygen levels are decreasing in carbon monoxide poisoning, but because your carbon dioxide levels are remaining normal, your body basically doesn't react. As a result of that low oxygen, you'll basically black out without any warning. The science behind the question here is lungs full of a breath of air have high oxygen concentration and low carbon dioxide concentration than your body does. So oxygen flows into your blood and carbon dioxide out of your blood, even though you're holding your breath. Then, after a period of time, empty lungs have lower volume, so fewer carbon dioxide molecules are needed to get the same concentration in your blood. Remember, this is a process of diffusion. Thus, carbon dioxide stops leaving your blood faster if the lungs are empty, meaning carbon dioxide levels in your blood reach critical levels faster, and you need to breathe sooner. Looking at this in a graphical standpoint, it's looking at divers. Here's normal breathing, here's normal breathing. Urgent need to breathe occurs when high carbon dioxide levels trigger breathing. It has nothing to do with your body perceiving oxygen levels. Also notice our pH can influence the hemoglobin binding uh, portion there. Keep in mind hemoglobin is a protein and as a result pH can influence its shape and its ability to bind oxygen. Lastly here, respiratory adjustments at high altitudes. If you've ever been to high altitudes, there's basically air is not quite as dense. Your body responds to quick movement to high altitude, which is considered to be above 8,000 feet, with symptoms of acute uh, mountain sickness, such as headache, shortness of breath, nausea, dizziness, all negative things. Becoming um, acclimated, acclimated to this area, um, respiratory and hemotrophic adjustments include increasing ventilation, can actually breathe more, or more exchange more air, supposedly. Also, you become more responsive to carbon dioxide pressure, and a substantial decline in an oxygen pressure stimulates this per peripheral chemoreceptors. So it's important if you're going up to high altitudes to adjust to this, to basically get yourself acclimated to this. Um, you want to not go from sea level to 14,000 feet in one day. You want to work your way up to that. Typically, it's suggested that you start from, if you're used to being at sea level, go up to 5,000 feet, then go above 8,000 feet, and then work your way up to 14,000 thousand feet here at Pikes Peak. Now, the body's going to do some of these adjustments. It's going to breathe a little heavier. You're going to drink a lot of water. Um, these are all ways you can try to negate some of this mountain sickness that does occur. It's simply occurring because your body's reacting to simply having less air density at a high altitude than what's typically used to at low altitude. You see this a lot with sports teams and events that go to potentially Denver, Mile High Stadium, or in Mexico where areas are very high in elevation. They go there up to a week before so they can get adjusted, their bodies adjusted to that lower amount of air density.